Today, um, in our neighbor to neighbor chat, we'll be focusing on growing squash. At the end of each presentation, we will take a, a minute for questions. Uh, so, so first of all, yellow zucchini, uh, crookneck, and patty pan are summer squash varieties. Uh, next slide, please. And I should mention that uh, uh, although I've grown many different types of squash, uh, the only ones of the summer squash that I've grown regularly have been zucchini. Um, uh, but anyway, they can be seven to eight inches long, sometimes longer. Uh, and crookneck uh, can be one and a half to two inches in diameter. Scallop types can get even thicker at three to four inches. Uh, you should pick the fruit when the skin is still tender. And by leaving the fruit on the plant, it inhibits the development of additional fruit. Also, you'll find that if you leave the zucchini on the, on the uh, plant too long, it becomes woodier. It's, it's not gonna be as tender. Next slide, please. So uh, there are many categories of winter squash. These are my favorites actually of the squashes. Uh, uh, basically the ones that I've grown the most have been acorn and butternut. Uh, and uh, there are others that are more popular, but those are the ones I like the best and they're small fruits. Uh, they uh, take about 80 to 100 days to harvest. So with all of these, you wanna plan uh, when, to, when to plant them and we'll get into a little bit more detail, but you need to be planning to harvest them before the first frost in the fall. So um, some have been bred for bush or, or, and some for uh, semi-vining growth habits. And then the next size up is intermediate fruits, which are about six to 12 pounds and take 110 days to harvest. And as we get into the bigger and bigger squashes, sorry about that. As we get into the bigger and bigger squashes, you'll see that they take that many longer days to harvest. But anyway, the intermediate varieties are banana, uh, kusha, hubbard, and sweet meat. Next slide, please. So the bigger ones, and they get bigger each time here, are 15 to 40 pounds or 120 days to harvest for the large fruits. And these are the Blue Hubbard, the Boston Marrow, and Jumbo Pink Banana. And then the last uh, are the, the really jumbo, uh, such as pumpkins, and the Big Macs and various mammoth varieties. And, and uh, these are 50 and up to 100 pounds or more. And of course, those are the things we see in the Guinness Book and stuff like that. And they take uh, about 120 days to harvest. The next slide, please. So winter squash, um, um, the, one of the more popular varieties lately anyway, is spaghetti squash. And, and although I haven't grown this, um, we certainly like to, to buy it. And it has a lot of advantages and I probably will grow it now, one of these years. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's very good when steamed or baked. Um, and um, when uh, another way uh, that, uh, and, a, and an advantage of all these winter squashes is the fact, of course, that you can store them for many months and uh, if you're going to store winter, uh, this version of winter squash, uh, you, should, uh, you should cook it first if you're going to freeze it. Um, otherwise, we, have, we still have some squashes from, from the last fall that are in our fruit basket that we haven't eaten yet. They last for many months. Next slide, please. So um, just to kind of recap all of this, uh, to compare summer and winter squash, uh, the summer squashes uh, can be in non-vining bushes uh, and come in many shapes and colors, and they have the shortest maturity of 40 to 50 days, whereas the winter squash take a little bit longer to mature, basically about twice as long, but I think it's worth it. Uh, they are much bigger uh, and they last much longer when you uh, store them if, if you're not able to eat them all right away. And there are many varieties that can... Uh, be picked early if you'd like. So the next slide, please. And this is all the resources. Uh, uh, I, I would also mention there are there's other resources available on the um, on the Virginia uh, websites that uh, go into much more detail about this and many other vegetables. So um, we're going to uh, move on to the next presentation now. So I will. Uh, oh, first, before we do that, I need to ask, uh, Laura, are there any questions on, on this section specifically? No questions at this point, but good information. Excellent. Okay, so let's, uh, let's move on to Liz then.
So <clears throat> I put a number of different pictures in here, and I just want to say this now before we get started, is when you plant your squash, you need to be uh, sure that you leave room for it to grow because the squash is generally a large plant. Next. So when you're pl planting, um, squash requires uh, full sun and it has to be warm 65 to 75 de degrees before you put your plants out. And usually you wanna put it mid-May, which is, I think our frost date this year is um, April, is it April 15th or May 15th? Ooh. Mid-May, mid-May 15th then. And the soil needs to be above 60 degrees. And usually you make a, a hill for your squash and you want to put four or five seeds in and then you're going to uh, thin that down to two or three seeds and try and keep them about four inches apart to give the plants room to grow underground. Um, and some people uh, start seedlings indoors. I find that I'm less successful when I do them indoors and I think it's because the uh, roots are really sensitive and transplanting doesn't work as well, but that's, that's just me. It's not saying you don't have to try it, but I've just not as been as successful as putting them in the ground. Um, another thing though that I have done is many times I'll plant them early and I will cover them. I've got plant covers that keep them kind of in an enclosed environment. So if we don't have any really cold days, it works out fine. Next. Mulching. <clears throat> so mulching can be many different things, but it covers the soil and it prevents weeds from growing, which reduces your workload for the summer. Um, it makes it easier uh, to water. You don't have to water as frequently. Um, it reduces the leaching of for fertilizer and it's an insulator. So it keeps everything underground at a more even temperature. So it makes it um, easier to grow. Um, the other thing is uh, if the, when the squash starts growing, if it's on your mulch, there's less chance of it becoming um, rotten or getting soft spots in it. Um, <clears throat> oh, and when you do, and this is sort of like with trees. So when you put mulch down, you wanna be sure that the stalk of the plant is um, like a couple inches away so that it's open for watering and it all, that also discourages any mildew or other diseases. And you can use almost anything, wood chips, cardboard, straw, landscape fabrics, and they now have some landscape fabrics out that are paper that disintegrate over time and, and you just plow them under when you're done. And also I find that mulching a lot of times will increase, increase the um, a quantity of uh, squash that you get. Next, please. I'm gonna move this out of the way. So vertical gardening with a, a trellis works really better for smaller things. Although I'm showing two squash here that are pretty big. I have a neighbor in my um, garden area who did butternut squash a uh, year before last. And she had each one of them in a um, piece of uh, pantyhose so that the weight wouldn't pull down the, the whole contraption that she had built as well as the plant. So um, some summer squash and gourds do well on a trellis. Uh, and my recommendation, if you want to try this, is to start with the smaller varieties so you get the feel for how it works. Heavier squash can be trellis, but they need support. Um, and there's a lot of trellises that you can buy uh, or you can create your own using wood and other straps of material. You can get really creative with it. Um, and zucchini, yellow squash, acorn squash, and delicata actually work on a trellis if you have the right plants. So some of those you buy and they're just a bushy, bushy plant stay in one place, but there's some of them that vine out a little bit. Winter squash are heavier and would need more support like, that I mentioned already. Um, using slings and um, tying them up. And then the thing to remember when you're building your trellis is that it needs to have a very strong foundation because these squash get uh, very heavy and they can straight sway the whole thing. I have some pictures that will show you how big they get. Next. All right, here's just two pictures of different uh, trellises. 
Um, you can see on the left, you can see the butternut squash. Um, this person is just letting them hang, hang free. And the one on the right is more of a cone-shaped um, trellis that, that things can just uh, climb up on. Next. Just a minute, I have to get this thing out of my way. Okay, this is um, a plant that I planted last year for the first time called Trombocino, and it's an Italian trumpet squash. If you look on the left, I built a trellis up here, and you can see it's starting to go across here. And if you look here, this is the same trellis in the back, and these are some other squash. But this particular squash is extremely invasive. It came across all of these beds and out to the other side. So I didn't know anything about the squash. The seeds were given to me. So I have a different plan this year about what I'm gonna do. Um, but you need to plan for the size of your vine as well as the size of your squash. Next. This is the size of that squash, the trombocino. So uh, I had no idea, I was told it was gonna get big, but I had no idea it would be this big. So it's an interesting squash because you can pick it young and use it as a summer squash. And I understand you can leave it on the vine and it becomes a winter squash. It gets a hard exterior and you can keep it you know, longer over the winter. Next. And these are just some of the resources that I used. Are there any questions? Yeah, we do have um, one question. Um, Jasmine answered in the, or I guess asked in the chat pod, um, clarification on plant spacing. Um, specifically, how far apart should the hills be? Um, she asked, should the, should the plants be four inches apart within one hill or are the hills four inches apart? Um, so looking, when you're planting in hills, you're gonna, plant, you know, four or five seeds together, and you're going to spin that down to a couple seeds. I, a lot of times, you know, if I'm lucky, I have, um, I, I'll just leave one or two, uh, the healthier plants that are there. But as far as how much you plant between plants, it's going to vary on the type of squash, but it can be 24 to 36 inches. Um, I've kind of followed some of that square Put gardening philosophy and I zigzag my, my plants so that you know I plant I'll plant a here plant here and now another one 24 inches in this direction I don't know if I can show it and 24 inches in this direction and so it's not exactly one straight line it's usually two I'm not sure I've totally finished answering that question but you really have to give a lot of room for a plant like the zucchini plant that was in one of my pictures um, probably was at least three feet almost four feet wide and I think that I had another squash that was a little too close to that. Um, so again, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of trial and error. And if you look at your seed packet, a lot of times it will tell you three feet. It will tell you four feet. And when you put that little seed in there, it looks like you have enough room for many, many others. But once it starts growing, uh, it'll fill that space. Thanks. That's the last question. Okay, uh, well, I should mention I once saw a squash plant growing between two gas pumps. So it only took a couple of square inches for it, for it to root, but obviously there wasn't any place for the vines to go. So um, Alicia, tell us what to look for as squash grows, please. This audio has cut out. Hopefully she comes back quickly. Alicia's frozen. Yeah. Um, okay. So when you look at your squash plant, there are male and female flowers, as Liz pointed out. The male flowers do appear before the female flowers. So people get all in a tizzy because they have these flowers and they're not getting any, any fruit. But the male flowers appear earlier so that they can attract the pollinators that will actually be the ones to fertilize the female flowers. Once the female flowers start arriving, you'll be able to recognize them because they do see the very beginning of that fruit, the ovary of the plant, right at the end of that flower. And it's very different from the male squash flower once you take a look at them. And then the pollinators should assist in fertilizing the female flowers. So you'll see lots of bees and, other, and wasps and all kinds of pollinators all around there. Um, if there's a lack of female flowers, it may mean there's a lack of pollinators in your garden. And so you might want to look into planting flowers and other plants that will attract them. 
you can also try to hand pollinate, which I know some people do religiously, no matter what you know their pollinator situation is. Some people really just like the peace of mind of knowing that the female flower has gotten, has been pollinated. And I do this, I have a um, lemon tree that I keep inside all winter and I do this with my lemon tree. I hand pollinate, I have a paintbrush. And you just go through with a paintbrush and you take the pollen from the male flower and you dot it into the female flower and sit and watch the magic happen later. So there are some common pests of the squash plant that I think anyone who's grown squash has been on the receiving end of. We have squash vine borers. These start out as an actual beetle looking bug, but their larvae are what actually burrow into the vine of the uh, squash plant. And they burrow in and they consume the inner workings of the vine, the xylem phloem. And so all you're left with is the outside edges that aren't really carrying enough nutrients. And one of the big indicators that you have a squash vine borer is that in the middle of the day, your plant just looks like it's desperate for water. It's just wilting and you're out there and you're spraying all kinds of water on it. And you can't understand what's happening. And so then you start to look around the base of the plant and you notice there's a little sawdusty looking residue there and you notice that the base of the plant might be kind of um, paperish looking, beige looking, it's discolored. And if you actually took a sharp knife and slit down the base of that plant, you would find the larvae in there feeding. I know my mom when I was a kid used to do this pull it out, wrap it in newspaper and stick it back in the ground and cross her fingers and hope for the best. And I do think she saved a squash plant or two that day, but I don't know that um, it's a common practice. It was just one of those things I marveled at as a kid. But once you have a squash vine borer inside your plant, it's really difficult to save them. It becomes mushy, it rots, the plant is really pretty far gone and you just need to get it out of there so that you don't have these larvae turning into new adults and actually coming back to haunt you later, like next year. Um, so this is the, the picture of the adult uh, squash borer, and it resembles a wasp. It's about a half inch long, orange abdomen and black dots on the back. The eggs are flat brown and very small, and these eggs are practically cemented to those leaves. So one of the best things that um, we have found for getting both squash borer eggs and squash bug eggs off of leaves is to use duct tape. Just do a little round of duct tape on your fingers and just very gently press it against the eggs and pull it away. And those tend to pull the eggs off without really damaging the leaves as much as scraping the eggs off would normally damage them. There are a few things you can do to try to prevent the squash vine borer. You can try to prevent disease resistant plants. You can consider row covers in early June before flowering. But again, once your squash flowers, you need those pollinators in there and row covers is going, to mean, is going to mean you just don't get any fruit. You definitely want to rotate your crops when it comes to squash. You cannot put it in the same place every year because those squash borers will overwinter in the soil. So if you had a problem there last year, you will have a problem this year. Um, if you must use pesticides, spray or dust them at the stems um, or on the stems at their base. So carbaryl, permethrin and bifenthrin are all approved for squash vine borer control, but be sure to read the label and follow the instructions very, very carefully. When it comes to squash bugs, these are large flattened insects. They most likely appear when the seedlings are young or flowering and they can cause young plants to wilt or die. And this picture here is a, is a picture of the squash bug eggs. So again, duct tape, just take duct tape, Make a little circle of it, wrap it around the, your fingers and just gently press it against those eggs to get them off. Rebecca, I think Alicia is back. Oh, awesome. Okay, Alicia, we are right about at recognizing squash bugs. If you wanna pick up. Okay, um, the squash bugs here is what they look like as adults. Um, and there in front of you on the slide is a, des a description of um, what they look like. And uh, they, um, they can live through the winter in sheltered places. Um, so uh, it's important to clean 
out plant debris to keep the area around your, your squash clean. Um, they lay clusters of eggs on the undersides of the leaves, which we saw a picture of that. And um, like she said, it's, it's easy, go to the ne next slide. And here is another stage of the squash bug. Um, they have several stages, which are called end stars. Um, this is a picture of the squash bug nymph. Um, and uh, a good way is you can lay out um, boards and pieces of newspaper. And what will happen is the bugs will go underneath at night. And then when you uncover them in the morning, it's easy, easy to collect them and, you know, to put them in your soapy water to destroy them. Um, they usually don't need pesticides, which is a good thing, um, unless they just totally get out of control. And then there are some recommendations. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Um, this is a picture of powdery mildew. Um, it, it's pretty easy to recognize. It's like this fuzzy growth um, um, on the upper and lower leaf sur surface, and also on um, on you know the stems and everything. Um, a prevention would be to plant in the full sun, um, give them plenty of space so the air can circulate around them. Um, and, you know, when it rains, it can, you know, it can dry them off and they won't stay moist. Um, and also the plant resistant varieties. Um, here is a list of some fungicides that you can, you can use. Um, I've used neem oil myself. Um, which works pretty well. Um, and if they're so severely, um, you know, damaged, it's good to just gather them up and destroy them so they won't, you know, infect other plants. Um, you know, there's several kinds of plants that you might have in your garden that can get this um, condition and, you know, you don't want to spread. So um, the next uh, slide, please. Okay, bacterial wilt, um, they will have a dull green appearance um, and eventually the, um, the leaf will die. And it's best to just gather them up and destroy them. There's really nothing you can do, you know, to, to save it. Um, and it's spread by cucumber beetles and um, Next slide, please. Okay, this is a condition um, called blossom end rot. Um, and it's, it's really, it's not a disease. Um, it's more of a, uh, a, you know, a condition that happens and it prevents some um, calcium from reaching the developing fruit. And it's caused by a lack of calcium in the develop, developing fruit. Um, it's always good to, when you're trying, you're getting ready to grow something, you know, to have um, a soil analysis um, to see, you know, what kind of, um, you know, nutrients that your soil is deficient in um, and the pH level and, um, and to know what, pH level that your, your plants do best in. Um, next slide, please. Okay, and there's the resources um, that this information comes from. And I don't know, are these, are these slides available to, to attendees? Can they get them with the resources? Yeah, if anyone wants copies of the resources, we're more than happy to send them out. Um, further answer Jasmine's question about the four inches apart 
that she had in the chat box. <clears throat> so when you plant your seeds, you don't, your mound is gonna be three feet or four feet away from the next plant. The number of seeds that you put there is you don't wanna crowd it too much. You don't wanna leave five seeds there. So the, the recommendation is usually like two or three um, so that the plants aren't crowding each other. And sometimes depending on the plant itself, I'll just uh, whittle it down to one because the plant is so robust that having three plants in that same place is just too much of a crowd. So other uh, than that, no questions. We, we had uh, another question in advance uh, about butternut squash, butternut squash plant that uh, seems to have healthy leaves. Um, but all season long, it only produced one butternut squash. So if, uh, if Terry's on, I, I may have some questions. Uh, for example, um, are there any pests in the area? The first thing that comes to mind is pests are eating the blossoms. Uh, it, it could be some other cause uh, like any of these diseases we've talked about, but it, since it appears healthy, probably not. But first guess is that pests are eating the blossoms. And in fact, uh, some people eat the blossoms too. I think it's a waste. I'd rather have the fruit, but that would be my best guess uh, uh, as to what the answer is here. Randall, I wonder if uh, some of the flowers are getting pollinated as well. It, if there's only one flower found though, that's probably not yet. That's certainly possible. It's just, it, it didn't get pollinated, so it didn't produce any more. Oh, it said it uh, had just one flower? Yes. Oh, okay. I misunderstood. So, I mean, yeah, that's possible, though, um, as as we as we learned earlier, that uh, if uh, if they're not getting pollinated, it's not going to continue to produce flowers. So, you're not going to see those blossoms. So, both answers, I think, are possibilities. <laughs> Another answer is uh, <laughs> is do what I do: get bees, and then you won't have a problem with pollinators. <laughs> is there a, um, a a companion plant for squash? Does anybody know? That's a good question. You now a lot of people do enjoy growing them, like the three sisters, so beans, squash, especially winter squash and corn all together. So you start mm -hmm. the squash, or I'm sorry, you start the corn and the corn starts to grow. You plant the beans, the beans can climb the corn, and then you plant the squash around the base so that they can kind of help shade out plants, um, shade out weeds and that sort of thing. And then you have pollinators for both the beans and the flowers of the beans and the squash, and then the corn more wind pollinates. That's, but um, I know that is a very popular growing method. I don't know specifically that there is, I mean, there are always companion plants. I don't know specifically of companion plants for squash beyond that. You can always well, bring in flowering plants, you know, nasturtiums, yeah. marigolds, mm -hmm. things like that. I'm just thinking that if there's a problem with uh, the pollinators, that maybe the flowers would draw, draw them in more. It could be, it could definitely be a problem with pollinators in the garden. It could be that someone is using pesticides nearby that's killing pollinators that would come into the garden. Um, it could be poor weather conditions, you know, rain or cold weather causing pollinators not to fly. Or sometimes when it gets extremely, extremely hot, you can get um, blossom drop. And so the, actually the pollen becomes ex sticky and too sticky for the pollinators to actually gather. And so those female flowers just wilt and fall off. And you see that shock, that heat shock and the blossom drop oftentimes with tomatoes and beans and those sorts of plants as well. And it can also happen with squash. So, I mean, yeah, we would definitely need to know more information about the conditions before we could fully answer this question. Mm 